Okay, so it's one o'clock. I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, again, welcome to this uh, Coffee Break webinar on uh, composites. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Olsson. I'm a specialist in composites. Been working on the subject for about 15 years now in different areas. Uh, I hope that. Uh, we'll be able to give you a short introduction and some inspirational thoughts around composites. And uh, I'm joined by my colleague. Hi, everyone. I'm Frida Rudelius. Uh, I work as a CAE engineer uh, in many different fields, but um, uh, mainly in composite analysis and uh, optimization, structural optimization. Perfect. So we'll uh, get going. Uh, there are possibilities to add questions in the, in the toolbox. Uh, please do that. We'll try and sum up the questions at the end of the presentation to give a good uh, flow through throughout the presentation. So let's get started. Uh, so first, a uh, short word about Eteplan Engineering. We are about 700 people in Sweden. We work in many different areas. Um, me and Frida is a part of the advanced manufacturing team together with our colleagues within the additive manufacturing. Uh, as you can see, we work with a lot of different application areas and technology areas. And uh, from a composite point of view, this is very interesting. We try to utilize the key expertise, for example, within battery technology to leverage the way we work with composites as well, as well within climate and plant engineering and all other fields. We know a lot. Composites is a part of Eteplan, and uh, we'll try to give you an introduction and some inspiration starting now. So, uh, first, give you a brief crash course uh, introduction to composites, so you have a little understanding of what it involves. Uh, we're talking polymer composites, and that means that we have a reinforcement material. It can be glass fiber or carbon fiber or Kevlar or many other types of uh, fibers. The material comes in many different forms. I will not dig any deeper into that. Uh, we need a bonding agent, a resin to bond the fibers together uh, to give it the strength it needs. Uh, there are basically two ways of doing this. Either you have a pre-impregnated uh, fabric material, it's called the prepreg, or you have resin that comes in canisters or buckets that you somehow uh, used to you know, wet out the fibers to give the properties. Uh, we work with a uh, layer by layer definition, uh, depending on how many plies and the thicknesses and the properties we need. Each ply or layer has a specific uh, orientation, uh, depending on the requirements of the part and the structure. Uh, we always have some sort of tool uh, that we build apart from. It could be a single sided tool, as we see here or it can be a dual-sided tool if you need uh, tool surfaces on both sides. Uh, many people see lay layup the, when you place the fibers on top of each other as a manual process. I'll show you a little bit later there that this, uh, of course, possible and mostly used today, but automation is possible as well. Uh, with the layup, you use a lot of different tools depending on the shapes to get all the creaks and crevices uh, following the fibers. Uh, we need some sort of curing process here, uh, temperature and pressure. Uh, temperature can range from room temperature to 300, 400 degrees C, depending on the performance requirements of the part. Of course, 400 degrees C, it's very expensive resins. Uh, 20 degrees C, you can buy at any hardware store, basically. Uh, and we have a set uh, temperature time curve to cure out the part. Uh, the microstructure you see here in the picture, you have uh, fibers going towards you in the, in the camera as the little dots, and from left to right, uh, the small waviness. And this is one of the key factors when designing composites, understanding what kind of fibers you need, what, how much fibers do you need, and what are the requirements. And in the end, you get these nice looking carbon fiber surfaces that are uh, looking very good. Uh, not the focus on our composite team to make aesthetically good uh, composites. And that's why we're here today. We want to focus on sort of application areas where you can use structural composites. Uh, doesn't matter if they look good or not. The, the strength and the properties is the key. Yeah, 
Yeah, so why composites? Um, we're not saying that it's good for every application, but it has a lot of advantages if you compare it with other more conventional materials. And one of the most uh, commonly spoken about is the extremely high specific stiffness and strength. And this is the, the ratio of uh, stiffness to weight, uh, which is very high uh, for composites. Uh, since it's a non-homogeneous structure, uh, we can optimize the, the material also, so we can go even further with the structural optimization and look into the, uh, the material and direct the properties in the most efficient way. Um, there is a larger freedom of design or a diff different kind of freedom in design than for uh, metal, for example, since we're dripping fabrics or sheets of fibers. Uh, we can allow more curvatures and uh, another type of, uh, of layouts uh, that might be possible with conventional uh, methods. Uh, fiber composites has excellent fatigue properties and no chemical activity, so no corrosion or mechanical degradation over time, which can make it very suitable for uh, high cycle products or uh, components that are in a corrosive environment or chemical environment. Um, we often aim to create efficient final assemblies with few specialized parts, so focus on the system instead of single components uh, to try to remove welds and joints uh, and make the overall system more efficient. Um, a bit like uh, we think when we design for AM or additive manufacturing. Um, the close to zero thermal expansion um, is something that could be really good in, in environments when you have the varying temperatures uh, and the expansion is, a, is an issue. Uh, and of course, the, the low weight, to go back to the first point again, the, the weight to stiffness and strength ratio. Um, and just to show you the uh, uh, comparison with steel and uh, aluminum here, in the right uh, plots we have uh, Young's modulus over density. And as you can see, for uh, carbon fiber and epoxy mixture, uh, we have like a fourth of steel in density and approximately the same or for some composites even higher um, Young's modulus. But this, of course, depends on the mixture that you're having, which resins and which uh, fibers, if it's glass or different kinds of uh, carbon fibers. Uh, yeah, and the way of thinking when uh, designing with composites and using it in your design process differs a bit from a more conventional uh, design processes since we now include uh, the design of the, the fiber material as well. So we have to include the analysis in an early stage in the design and also think about how we're supposed to manufacture it because we have to use that direction of the fiber in this whole process. So all of these steps, the analysis, the design and manufacturing are much more closely linked and have, must be iterated in early stages of the design. Uh, so here we often use uh, simulated uh, driven uh, concept development. Uh, and one point I would like to stress here is that, uh, as I mentioned before, that often the notion is that composites are made part by part, uh, not very high volume production. Uh, I would state the contrary. There are many applications where you produce a lot of, lot of parts. Uh, look at a hockey stick, for instance. Uh, the key thing is the design for automation, design for high volume. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's an aerospace part. Uh, that's automation in one way. On the right-hand side here, the green cell is for automotive, very high volumes, uh, short cycle times. So uh, what, what I say is that if you want to make composite parts in the hundreds of thousands, that is possible. It's not a sort of dream. Uh, it's technologically ready, available and used on an everyday basis. So uh, we have five areas where we'd like to highlight some inspiration uh, to get you thinking on wh where can you use composites, where can we support in composites, where can you, your 
business uh, take full advantage of uh, the composite material. Uh, there are other application areas, of course, but just to give you some inspiration. Uh, and I think the most well-known uh, application areas is, of course, aerospace. We look at the Boeing and Airbus planes. The weight ratio of composites in the 787 is very high. It's far above 50%. Uh, and of course, that's fuel saving. Formula One, you know, high performance. Uh, mountain bikes is a very good example, I think, where composites and carbon fiber structure are just growing on a day to day basis, especially now with the corona, everybody's taking their vacation at home. Uh, composites are very good here, freedom of design, high stiffness, really low weight, uh, and cost is coming down, uh, which is interesting. Um, we have two Swedish cars currently, uh, the Polestar 1, a lot of carbon fiber, the Koenigsegg as well, a lot of carbon fiber. So these are the cases you often see and sort of uh, think about when you say carbon fiber composites or glass fiber composites. And, and this, these are really good examples, but I think where we want to focus is where can the industry benefit from using composites? Uh, and um, we're looking at the trends as with our battery team, uh, a lot of electric electrification ongoing in all areas of the industry. Uh, a lot of talk about autom autonomous driven things, uh, more efficient supply chains and distribution solutions. We order packages as, as like there's no tomorrow. And here again, reducing weight, uh, improving uh, battery life. You can run further on each charge. Uh, th that saves you money. That's going to give you a good business case. And with that, uh, some examples that we think uh, that uh, are good for in, for inspirational use. If we look at any ordinary truck, uh, you have a lifting fork that goes up and down. A lot of the time it's just not loaded with any, any weight, but still there's a weight going up and down that takes power from the system. Uh, this lifting carriage, for instance, it's a 12-part 12 well, 12 welded steel structure. Uh, it works very good. Uh, but what would the uh, implications be if we introduce uh, some carbon fiber in here? Uh, we get one part instead. Uh, so we do what we call a one-shot uh, cure. Uh, you make everything in one, one part uh, and cure it instead of the 12 welded part. Uh, the design can be adapted to be very futuristic or very similar. Uh, so the user doesn't feel that it's uh, sort of it feels like on an everyday everyday basis, but foremost, we can save fifty percent of weight. And if you have uh, ten thousand of these trucks uh, sold to customers, if you look at the total business ca business case, the total footprint uh, of your truck and the less electricity it will need, uh, I think that would sum up to quite a lot of reduced CO two. So again, integrated structures, part consolidation. Uh, getting the many parts into one, uh, one of the strengths with composites. Uh, Frida mentioned the thermal uh, stability of carbon fiber, uh, close to zero in thermal expansion. Uh, very interesting in workshops where you don't have, have or cannot afford to invest in very expensive uh, workshop uh, climate control. Uh, carbon fiber could be uh, suitable here if you have very high, high performance parts that you don't want to uh, destroy during assembly because the temperature tolerance is just varying. The carbon fiber fixture could be a, a help here. Uh, and also look at the sort of reduced time to implement a new fixture in production. Uh, you, don't, you can take out one varying parameter, uh, the workshop temperature uh, from the qualification. And that's quite interesting. So there are quite a lot of interesting applications that can be uh, utilized that can utilize this zero uh, CT uh, with composites. I want to just note, this, this is one of the main driver why things go bad with composites. Uh, we often bond or bolt something to something in metal. So if we don't take this into account, things will go very bad uh, long term. Uh, so it's just sort of raising a finger here to say that not everything is perfect. You need to handle it. Uh, Again, just an example, uh, a lot of heavy steel structures in the world moving, high speed, uh, high frequency uh, accelerations. Uh, precis precision for a milling machine like this is uh, key, uh, drives a lot of the investment cost. And you often spend a lot of money controlling the temperature in the workshop. 
uh, if we would re replace these uh, steel beams that controls the milling head or the milling head itself, uh, we would reduce weight, as we said. We could run faster on the same engines with the same precision. We can design the composite to reduce uh, vibrations by introducing dampening properties, which is interesting. Again, the zero thermal expansion, interesting. Uh, and if you look at the total business case as we like to do is, in the end, this results in, you can design with lower size, uh, reduced size uh, engines to drive the milling machine. You could reduce energy consumption, reduce wear and tear, less maintenance cost and improve uptime. And that's money in the end for the end user. So it's again, thinking the sort of business case, why do I benefit from this? Uh, customization, there are a lot of applications where you have custom designs. Hockey stick, for instance, front forks for a motor sport a motorcycle. You define the stiffness based on what the user needs because we apply the fibers in the specific directions as we showed previously. Uh, we don't have the corrosion. We can design uh, spring blades as with the prosthetic here uh, to meet the, the weight and the sort of running uh, capability of, of the user. Uh, weight reduction, of course, uh, Frida mentioned the fatigue properties are excellent. Uh, so customization, that's a big driver in composites. It's sort of getting the end user to, uh, with the optimal performance of, of the part. Uh, but again, raising a war warning uh, here a little bit. Uh, metallics and composites, it's not a big thing, uh, but if you don't take care of it, you will face issues again uh, in the design and in the service. So again, you need to understand the system here, uh, how to do this. So, Priya. Yeah, um, so I'm going to describe the, the last concept and also how we've implemented the simulation-driven design process in that, because that is something that we work with a lot at Etteplan, um, not just for composites, but uh, it's very important when we, we work with composites and uh, 3D printing, basically. Uh, so I'm going to describe the process uh, of our work. We usually start with conducting a pre-study uh, where we define the scope, we perform case studies and uh, derive concepts or several concepts in many cases. Um, do cost calculations and form a business case um, out of what would the advantages be of, of uh, uh, changing maybe to metal from metal to composite uh, or any other business case that uh, the customer might want to look into. Uh, then we move into the product development phase um, where we include design for manufacturing, structural optimization, uh, stress analysis and uh, manufacturing preparations if that's needed. Uh, and we have a big focus on structural optimization here, both regarding the material and the structure. Um, and then we have a close relation to the su supply chain and the composite industry. Um, so we can supply you with construction and delivery of tooling and fixtures for the manufacturing of your composite structures and training, of course. Uh, we can manufacture the parts or prototypes. Yeah, and uh, do quality assurance and inspections and testing of uh, various uh, kinds. And now we're going to look at a pre-study that we did uh, of a lifting tool uh, used in automation industry in a factory. Um, the focus here was on overall weight reduction because they wanted to improve their handling capacity. Uh, by increasing the speed and accuracy um, and uh, to lower the overall energy consumption and reduce wear and maintenance uh, which would improve the machine uptime uh, all of these combined basically uh, reduce wear and maintenance uh, would be uh, uh, somewhat handled by changing to composite since it's in a uh, quite corrosive and chemical environment so Composite is a good option there, uh, and then we can uh, lower the weight, or well, that was the aim, to lower the weight quite a lot uh, to be able to increase speed uh, and maybe uh, lower the 
uh, the power of the, the motors that was necessary. Um, so we started with the original component and from that we made a design space. Uh, so we increased the volume as much as we were allowed to with uh, um, so it wouldn't uh, bump into any other components in the surroundings. Um, we, have, we have fixed interfaces uh, to other components. And uh, uh, then we applied uh, a few constraints and load cases to try to drive an optimization to an optimal solution. Um, and from this, we did a topology optimization. Uh, and I'm not going to go into what a topology optimization is too much, but uh, it's a way of finding the, the key low paths within a given design space for a certain set of constraints and uh, load cases, of course. Uh, so here we found the low paths, uh, which makes it as stiff as possible uh, for a limit of uh, um, a volume limit or a mass limit, so to say. Um, but this cannot really be uh, manufactured in any uh, uh, simple way. Uh, other than maybe 3D printing. Uh, so we came up with a solution that followed the low paths, uh, but still was manufacturable in a composite um, manufacturing method and uh, yeah, followed these uh, low paths. Um, on this, we did uh, some uh, uh, FE analysis um, to uh, uh, look at the stiffness of the structure, if it's stiff in relation to the original one, uh, to identify if there are any hotspots for stresses, um, and uh, look at different failure criteria for composites. Uh, there are quite a few, and uh, we looked at some of them. And also um, bearing strength. And uh, we decided to uh, stiffen up the structure a bit more to make it as stiff as the original um, part, uh, but much uh, more light. Um, and uh, I think the next slide shows um, an improved uh, concept for uh, with revised tooling definition. So it's simpler to manufacture, uh, it's cheaper to manufacture than the original composite concept, uh, and it, we have removed uh, the hotspots that we could see from the analysis. Um, here you can also see in the lower image uh, that we have uh, uh, made flat patterns. So uh, of this layup, we can um, uh, take each, each ply and uh, do these sketches uh, from the FE analysis that you can use to cut out your fabric cloth or fabric sheets from in order to make the manufacturing more efficient. And uh, we can also actually optimize this layup in uh, our FE tools to uh, make as few as possible so the manufacturing takes as short amount of time as possible because that's often the, the driving in cost, the, the manufacturing time. Uh, so it's a good uh, idea to focus on, on optimizing the, the layup for manufacturing but also of course structural optimizations. Um, so yeah, we can, can come up with these flat patterns and also perform complete documentation of the manufacturing process. So basically a ply book which describes the process of the manufacturing. So that becomes as simple as possible. I think that was the final. Yes, that is the uh, final. So, yeah, so we, we thought like this, that uh, there are people on the line maybe there are some questions that we could address uh, we try to give some time for that uh, in the end but i think and i hope that we could have given you some inspiration in this very short uh, time frame on where and how to use composites uh, there are of course many many more areas uh, where it can be applied but it's just to get you all to start thinking around your parts and products and businesses where, where could i use utilize this I think the simple, sim simplest example uh, with composites is sort of uh, trolleys in the workshop that are made of steel and weighs 100 kilos and you made them out, out of carbon fiber and they weigh 30 kilos and that's a trolley that's 70 kilos lighter that somebody needs to push around. I think that's by far the simplest example uh, I can come up with uh, and that's 
why we're here to help with ideas around that.